Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the, uh, the warm introduction. And I'm very pleased to be uh, once again here at Erpic's headquarters in order to give a talk on uh, a topic of enormous importance. And the, the title I've chosen goes to the very essence of what is going on here in Cyprus in the, the, the negotiations that have resumed. And the title I've given the talk is Guardians of Fundamental Rights or Servants of the New State of Affairs, the proper role of judges in a post-settlement uh, Cyprus. I'd like to begin by um, referring to the remarks of the Chief Justice of New Zealand, of all places, in a lecture she gave at the University of Auckland in July 2010. Dame uh, Sean Elias, the Chief Justice of New Zealand, uh, chose as her principal theme the interconnectedness of the three branches of the legal profession, which she described as teachers, judges, and practitioners of law. And in that context, uh, Chief Justice Elias assessed the influence of the thinking coming out of the law schools and explained that academic lawyers have a greater freedom than others involved in the development of the law. Academic lawyers have the freedom to identify the questions that must be asked. A little later in her lecture, Chief Justice Elias asserted that the academic lawyer has the ambitious task of looking to the whole of a particular issue. And no less importantly, the legal academic has the duty to act as one of the guardians of the rationality of the law, with the weighty consequential responsibility of providing a reality check whenever the need arises. Now, as a legal academic, I'm honoured to assume the responsibilities identified by Chief Justice Elias uh, over in New Zealand. However, as a, a non-practicing solicitor and member of the legal profession in England, I'm also mindful of the warning issued on the 18th of April of last year by Lord Judge, the then head of the judiciary uh, of England and Wales at the Commonwealth Law Conference. According to Lord Judge, we must never take the rule of law for granted. Never, ever. We as lawyers have the trained eyes to see and the trained lips to voice the alarm signals. We have a particular responsibility uh, to be vigilant. It's sometimes said that the Cyprus question involves a battle between 40,000 Turkish troops and 40,000 Greek Cypriot lawyers. That's a rather simplistic uh, assertion, but it does draw attention to the fact that if you are engaged in a battle and you have limited weapons at your disposal, weapons in the, the hard sense of the word, the law is often your best weapon of choice. Although the two, I would submit, should go hand in hand, at least in this part of the world, in, in, in the specific context of, of this part of the world. And I'm not an advocate of aggression, I'm an advocate of, of the use of military forces in a self-defense capacity as a, as, a, as a main principle. Now, with those um, preliminary remarks uh, behind me, let me uh, now turn to the substance of, of my talk, which is to address three interconnected uh, questions. The first is, has the judiciary of the Republic of Cyprus, or indeed any citizens of the Republic of Cyprus, been formally consulted or otherwise folded into the ongoing negotiations to compose the constitutional and legal instruments designed to settle the Cyprus question, and if not, why not? Secondly, what role should be accorded to the judiciary in a post-settlement Cyprus? And thirdly, which constitutional and justice-related questions should form the subject matter of, a, of what I would hope will become a proper and transparent consultation exercise. Now I'm going to split this up into three parts and perhaps we can have a, 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 a brief discussion at the, end, at the end of each. The first question 
uh, has the judiciary or uh, the citizens of the Republic been formally consulted about or otherwise folded into the ongoing negotiations? Well, as far as I'm aware, and I'm only an outsider peering in, the answer to that question would appear to be uh, in the negative. And that begs, uh, and if, if my assumption is correct, then that, I would submit, uh, is contrary to the requirements and expectations of the separation of powers as a constitutional principle. Uh, in American, uh, in the American and the British uh, constitutional traditions that, that I'm more familiar with in view of my background, the, 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 the separation of powers owes its philosophical origins to the works of writers such as Aristotle, Locke, and Montesquieu, as well as the, the founding fathers of the United States. But here in Cyprus, notwithstanding the defects of its uh, constitution of 1960 and its uh, centuries of imperial rule where there was a concentration of powers rather than a separation of powers, here in Cyprus, the, con the separation of powers now forms an integral part of the constitutional arrangements of the Republic of, S of Cyprus. Indeed, in a uh, Supreme Court case dating back to 1981, the Supreme Court of Cyprus referred to the separation of powers, that is to say, between the executive, legislative and judicial branches of government, as a principle that pervades our system of law and finds expression in the Constitution. Now, the point I'm making is that the separation of powers requires each branch of government to pay due respect to the other branches of government. And it's in that context that I would argue that the judiciary, without becoming politicized, should nonetheless be accorded a proper role in uh, the, the settlement process, albeit in, in a consultative uh, capacity. In other words, the judiciary, if it's not already being consulted, should be formally uh, consulted. What is clear and is that not only do many people such as me have profound concerns about the substance of what is being negotiated, we also have concerns about the procedure which has been adopted with a view to resulting uh, in a comprehensive settlement. So my, 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 these initial remarks I'm going to make now concern the procedural defect. I've written about this before, I've published articles on this topic before, and I'm only now going to just summarize my, my main uh, arguments. Uh, what seems clear is that the, the head of the executive branch of government here in the Republic of Cyprus, President Anastasiadis, has assumed the mantle of leader of the Greek Cypriot community. And he has entered into negotiations with Dr. Eroglu, who is, who is described as the leader of the Turkish Cypriots. The, the process has been conducted in secret, and it's been conducted behind closed doors, and it's been conducted without any public participation. That is problematical. Philosophically, if one reads the works of, say, Aristotle, he makes a very important point for, for the citizens to have confidence in a constitution, they should have a say in its composition and they should have uh, an affinity with what is uh, produced ostensibly to, to govern them and the institutions that will govern them. And that has been absent from Cyprus throughout the decades, but indeed it's been absent throughout the centuries. Every time there's been a turning point in the constitutional history of Cyprus. The decisions have been taken by members of the executive branch of government, of one state or another, and the people, and indeed the judges on the island, have been shut out of the decision-making process. Now that is problematical. It's problematical for a number of reasons. I, and it brings to mind the remarks of, uh, in a different context, uh, of uh, Judge Damon J. Keith in the United States case, where he said that democracies die behind closed doors. The Republic of Cyprus, let's remember, is a democracy. It's a state, a sovereign state, which is part of the European Union, part of the Commonwealth, part of the United Nations. It's a 
country whose constitution rests on the separation of powers and the rule of law, and yet its constitutional future is being decided, it seems, behind closed doors, subject eventually to public participation in the form of a, a, a double referendum. That's deeply uh, troubling. But it's keep in keeping with the philosophy of the negotiations, the top-down philosophy of the negotiations, in fact, when the concerns such as the ones I've just raised uh, were put to the Minister for Europe in the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office back in 2009, the minister gave these concerns short shrift. This is what the minister said. I know that some people get depressed and some of the media get a bit angry because they think that the talks are happening in private and in secret. But sometimes talks of this nature, which are very sensitive, grow a bit like mushrooms. They grow best in the dark. Well, events since 2009, when those remarks were issued, have exposed the fallacy inherent, inherent in the British ministerial pronouncement. By the same token, uh, people such as me <laughs> have been spectacularly unsuccessful in attempting to change the philosophy of the negotiations from the top down uh, to, to the bottom up. And as a consequence, we are where we are, and the negotiations are taking place in, in, in strict secrecy with next to no, if no, uh, participation by the public whatsoever. Now, this is not only in keeping with history, it's also in keeping with what's been described as con... Uh, I, I always have difficulty s pronouncing this word. Consociational democracy. And if I go back to that... Uh, uh, one of the seminal articles written by Arendt Liphart, the academic who, who is often associated with this concept. If we, if we look at one of his articles in World Politics in January 1969, uh, Liphart um, describes consociational democracy as government by elite cartel designed to turn a democracy with a fragmented political culture into a stable democracy. I'm struck by his use of the phrase government by elite cartel. It's instructive to what's happening here in Cyprus today. The, uh, the leaders... Hello. Hello. Yes, by all means. The leaders of, uh, of two communities, in inverted commas, have come together in secret as if they are operating a cartel to fix their common futures in defiance of, I would add, the demographic realities all around them and in the absence of any meaningful participation by citizens or the leaders of other communities lawfully residing in the Republic uh, of Cyprus. And that is something that I'm going to skip over what, a lot of what, I was going, what I've written down. That, I would submit, is contrary to the modern approach towards decision-making in Europe and in the wider liberal democratic world. In the modern liberal democratic world, decisions are normally taken after a transparent and proper consultation process involving all citizens and all stakeholders in the society. And that would include, in appropriate cases, uh, members of the judiciary. And indeed, there are, I'm not going to go into this in any detail now, there's even legislation, or, or, or uh, there is even international treaty law which uh, promotes the, the concept of public participation in decision making. An example is the Aarhus Convention uh, relating to environmental matters, which actually makes it a, a legal requirement in appropriate circumstances for proper consultation to take place prior to uh, any decision being taken. And indeed, the Treaty on the European Union expressly says uh, at Article 1 that the treaty, this is the Treaty on European Union, the founding treaty of, of, of the organization that Cyprus is now a part of, this treaty marks a new stage in the process of creating an ever closer union among the peoples of Europe in which decisions are taken as openly as possible and as closely as possible to the citizen. Well, that 
principle which is embedded in Article 1 of the treaty does not seem to be operating properly here in Cyprus. So to sum up, what, have I, what am I asserting in this uh, first part of this talk? The f I'm, I'm asserting that whatever is decided in the substantive negotiations should be preceded by a proper and transparent consultation exercise, open to all, and as part of that consultation exercise, the judiciary of the Republic of Cyprus should be properly consulted over its future and over the future makeup of the judiciary of the Republic. And at that, that point, I'm going to pause uh, and ask if there are any questions. There may not be, but if there are, I'm willi willing to, to take them. Shall I press on then? That takes me now to the to the second uh, question, which actually goes to the to the to the nub of the, the matter. What role should be accorded to the judiciary in a post settlement Cyprus? It's a straightforward question, but it does not elicit a correspondingly straightforward answer. I'm my background is uh, from the the English. Uh, legal tradition and more broadly what might be described as the, the, the democratic tradition of open liberal democracies which respect the rule of law and have a, a long tradition of respecting the rule of law, although that doesn't, that, that doesn't always function in all cases as we know. So my approach is very much um, determined by my own professional and academic uh, background. And with that in mind, uh, a useful starting point would surely be to acknowledge that in any open liberal democracy which respects the separation of powers and the rule of law, the judiciary constitutes one of the three branches of government. Now, in this part of the world, in the Eastern Mediterranean, it's normally been the executive branch of government that has been the dominant actor. And sometimes, as we've seen in the dictatorships in the Eastern Mediterranean, the executive branch of government is also simultaneously the legislative branch of government or controls the legislative branch of government and the judiciary is very much populated by puppets of the, the executive branch or of the dictator as the case may be. So there is not a long-standing tradition in the Eastern Mediterranean of judges uh, exercising the independence and the authority that... Uh, that they have in other parts of the world. One might argue that Israel is an exception uh, to that rule in the, uh, the, the post-independence era. But even when the British were in control of this part of the world, they didn't properly respect the separation of powers. The governor, for example, not only exercised executive power, but he also exercised legislative power, and he had a strong influence over, at the very least, the uh, appointment of judges in, in British colonial Cyprus. So there isn't a long-standing tradition of, of respect for the separation of powers or indeed for the concept of judicial independence, which is an essential manifestation of the separation of powers. But if there is to be a settlement of the Cyprus question, then a starting point must surely be that the separation of powers must exist and that the judiciary must be implanted within the separation of powers as one of the three branches of government and it should be independent of the other two. As to the primary duties of judges in open liberal democracies, uh, these were neatly articulated in a lecture delivered in 1998 by the Honourable Murray Gleeson, the then Chief Justice of Australia. Chief Justice Gleeson observed that judges maintain the rule of law, uphold the constitution, and administer civil and criminal justice according to law. In turn, these duties hinge upon the independence, impartiality, and integrity of the judiciary as part of the separation of powers. So we come back to the separation of powers, and according to Ju uh, Chief Justice Gleeson, although judges are servants of the public, they are not public servants. The duty of a judge is to administer justice according to law, without fear or favour, and without regard to the wishes or policy of the executive government. And that's a principle that is of crucial importance, but with regret it is not properly understood, 
let alone properly applied in large parts of the Eastern Mediterranean and the broader uh, Middle East. So if there is to be a settlement of the Cyprus question, one would hope that those principles, which uh, are already by and large respected within the Republic of Cyprus today, will find their way into the judiciary and into the governmental arrangements of a post-settlement Cyprus. The snag is, and there are a number of snags, but the fundamental snag is what do we mean by justice and what do we mean by law? And that is what the negotiations in uh, Nicosia are in part turning around. And there is a difference of, of, of approach. I'm hesitant and to use the phrase clash of civilizations, and I'm not going to use that phrase, but I, I would submit that there is a clash of values. And the clash of values is reflected in the different approaches to the role of the judiciary. Now, I'm not privy to the documents that are being negotiated in Nicosia, but I do have access to the ill-fated Annan plan of 2004, which was cobbled together again in secret and um, published by the United Nations in various stages, culminating in the, uh, the publication of the 31st of March 2004. And within the... Um, the Annan Plan, one finds an extraordinary uh, provision, which I understand is lying at the heart of the discussions in Nicosia which are taking place today. And this is a provision which flies in the face of the separation of powers doctrine. This was Article 6.3 of the main articles of the ill-fated Annan Plan. And under this provision, the Supreme, which is not implemented of course, the Supreme Court shall, inter alia, resolve disputes between the constituent states, or between one or both of them, and the federal government, comma, and resolve on an interim basis deadlocks within federal institutions if this is indispensable to the proper functioning of the federal government, that is to say the executive branch. Now, if that provision had come into force, and thankfully it was not, it would have exposed post-2004 Cyprus to a potentially divisive and devastating set of consequences. And it is frightening to think, and I hope that this is not taking place, it is frightening to think that a provision such as that is lying at the heart of the negotiations in Nicosia. Now why should the judiciary be kept out of politics? Why should the judiciary be kept out of assuming the role that should properly be fulfilled by either the legislature or by the executive. Well, again, one only needs to read the works of Aristotle or Locke or Montesquieu to understand. I'll just read to you what James Madison wrote in one of the f Federalist Papers. Madison was one of the founding fathers of the United States and indeed its fourth president. president. Madison advised that the accumulation of all powers, be they legislative, executive and judiciary, in the same hands may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. So the concentration of powers results in tyranny. The separation of powers prevents tyranny from arising. That's the constitutional and philosophical theory underpinning the separation of powers doctrine. In the 20th century, in a, a, a case that reached the Privy Council, that's a, a court in London uh, that has jurisdiction over some parts of the Commonwealth and some parts of the, what's left of the British Empire. In 1957, Lord Simmons stated in one of those uh, Privy Council cases, in a federal system, so this is relevant to Cyprus because there's a reference here to a federal system, in a federal system, the absolute independence of the judiciary is the bulwark of the Constitution against encroachment, whether by the legislative or by the executive branch of government. And this is the key point. To vest in the same body, executive and judicial power is to remove a vital constitutional safeguard. I can go on. In the United States Supreme Court case of Mistretta and the United States, Associate Justice Blackman declared 
that the legitimacy of the judicial branch of government ultimately depends on its reputation for impartiality and non-partisanship. That reputation may not be borrowed by the political branches, that is to say the executive and the legislative, to cloak their work in the neutral colours of judicial action. So the, ju the legitimacy of the judiciary would be undermined if they were accorded uh, powers that related to the executive. And there's a fourth reason. Uh, there, there are many, but I'll just finally draw your attention to a fourth reason. And that's simply that judges are not qualified to enter the sphere of policy making, especially at executive level. Uh, in the words of, of a dissenting judgment in a Canadian Supreme Court case, which has been subsequently cited with approval, for example, in, in the English case of, uh, of A and others and Home Secretary, courts are specialists in the protection of liberty and the interpretation of legislation. So judges are therefore well placed to subject to careful scrutiny items of legislation such as criminal justice legislation. But on the other hand, and this is the crucial point, courts are not specialists in the realm of policy making, nor should they be. So to sum up, to sum up, the Annan plan was in part predicated on, um, I'll, just, I'll just rewind there for a second, the Annan plan was predicated on a provision which envisaged the judiciary in the Supreme Court assuming executive and other non-judicial functions. That provision flew in the face of thousands of years of constitutional and legal practice which is predicated on the separation of powers. And if, if the current negotiations are built around the premise that the Supreme Court should be given what, it, what is described as tie-breaking executive or legislative functions, then that would be uh, dangerous for a number of different reasons, including the, the, the four that I've highlighted in my, uh, in my analysis so far. So to sum up, Cyprus should not be the exception. Why should Cyprus be the exception? Cyprus should fall within the mainstream of open, lib liberal, democratic uh, constitutionalism and the judiciary should exercise a judicial function and should not, under any circumstances, be given executive or legislative powers. To do so would fly in the face of history and it would fly in the face of legal and constitutional theory. So. I think that's the first, uh, the first major function, or an another major function of the judiciary, therefore, is to, is to perform judicial functions. But there are a couple of other major functions of the judiciary that I want to just dwell upon in the last few minutes of this talk. And this takes me to the question that I've put in the, the title of the talk. Should the judges of a um, post-settlement Cyprus be the guardians of fundamental rights? Or will they become the servants of the new state of affairs? Now, in a normal constitutional setup, the judiciary will indeed perform both of those duties because it's the duty of the judiciary to protect fundamental rights and uphold the constitution. The problem in Cyprus is that there is an attempt to reach a settlement, as I understand it, there is an attempt to reach an Annan plan style settlement which will erode fundamental rights or make those fundamental rights subject to derogations but at the same time ensure that the judges are there to enforce this new state of affairs which is predicated on the undermining of rights. I return to the mainstream the mainstream approach in Western or open liberal democracies. What is the position in open liberal democracies? Uh, the point was eloquently made by Mr. Justice Elias, as Lord Justice Elias was then known, in the English High Court case of, ironically enough, Elias and Secretary of State for Defence. 
According to Mr. Justice Elias, the courts are the guardians of fundamental rights. When the same case reached the Court of Appeal, the Court of Appeal uh, proclaimed a very similar, in the words of Lady Justice Arden, in their capacity as guardians of the rule of law, judges have a responsibility to ensure that the government respects the rights of individuals conferred by the law. So the judiciary performs this vital function as the guardian of fundamental rights. And I deliberately use the phrase fundamental rights because in Cyprus the citizens are not solely endowed with human rights flowing from the European Convention. The citizens of Cyprus are also endowed with fundamental rights flowing from European Union law, flowing from the Constitution of 1960, flowing from legislation and flowing from the principles of the common law and, the equ and equity which now form part of the case law of the Republic of Cyprus. So that's why I use the phrase fundamental uh, rights. And I won't uh, read to you uh, from separate case law, which I'm not an expert on, but as I understand it, the, ca the case law of the Republic of Cyprus confirms that the judges here in the Republic regard themselves as being very much guardians of fundamental rights. And now we come to the crux, the crux of the whole matter. Will the judges of a post-settlement Cyprus be the guardians of the existing fundamental rights of the citizens and other lawful residents of the Republic of Cyprus? Or will the judges be the guardians of a new state of affairs which curtails existing fundamental rights? I return to the theme I touched on earlier. This is an issue that reflects the clash of values that is regrettably being seen in Nicosia. There is a clash of values. On the one hand, we have what I would hope is an approach that's rooted in the mainstream, open, liberal, democratic tradition that the European Union proclaims to be part of and the Republic of Cyprus is a part of. And on the other hand, we have an approach that reflects the statism inherent in the principles of Ataturk and in the Constitution of Turkey and the top-down governmental approach that regrettably uh, prevails in large parts of the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, uh, we have some, doc some documentary evidence to support the assertion that fundamental rights are at risk. I only need to refer you to the Annan Plan of 2004, the ill-fated Annan Plan, and documents such as the ill-fated proposal for an act of adaptation of the terms of accession of the U United Cyprus Republic to the European Union, a document dated 16th of April 2004, which thankfully didn't uh, come to fruition because of the, the outcome of the, the so-called double referendum in Cyprus back in 2004. The Annan Plan sought to enshrine a system of apartheid in the Republic of Cyprus. And the negotiations going on in Nicosia today could very well be premised on the same uh, objective. But of course we don't have access to the relevant documents uh, so we don't know for certain. And for that reason we have to resort to something that I find a little bit uncomfortable doing and that is drawing upon the, the leaks from the American Embassy which have been published by WikiLeaks. I'm only going to refer you to one document published by WikiLeaks uh, in May 2009. And uh, this concerns a, um, a conversation that was had by the American ambassador in the Republic of Cyprus with the, the ambassador in inverted commas of Turkey to the so-called Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus in inverted commas. And this is what the, this cable um, uh, supposedly uh, says. On bizonality, a key Turkish Cypriot demand, he, that is to say the said amb ambassador in inverted commas of Turkey, thought there would be no residential mixing 
no residential mixing, of Turkish and Greek Cypriots post-solution. He quickly clarified his comments, however, stating that there would be ceilings, in inverted commas, that limited Greek Cypriot settlement in a future Turkish Cypriot constituent state. Ceilings are exactly what this draft act of, of adaptation from 2004 and the Annan plan both uh, envisaged. Beside this text in the WikiLeaks document, an American embassy official has added a note in brackets which reveals the following. Our pro-solution Turkish Cypriot contacts, both in the office of Mr. Talat, the then Turkish Cypriot leader, and the so-called Turkish uh, Republic of Northern Cyprus Minister of Foreign Affairs, claim that Turkey wants as ethnically pure a Turkish Cypriot constituent state as possible, even if this means giving up more territory in return. Now, I pause for a moment here to make two major observations. The first that is that in Australia, which is a federation, many times larger than Cyprus, the constitution, as I understand it, guarantees personal freedom of movement between the states without burden or restriction. The constitution also guarantees freedom of interstate trade and commerce. They have none of those Annan plan style restrictions. So if the constitution of, a, of Australia, a federation, can provide such guarantees, why should the constitution of a post-settlement Cyprus do anything less? The second point I wish to make is to do with morality. Leave aside the law and the constitutional practice in other parts of the world. This is not a question of law, this is a question of morality. This is a question of ethics. This is a question of, of history. Does Cyprus want to discard one of the central lessons of history, which is that the law should exist to empower citizens, to constrain the government, and to promote justice, or does Cyprus wish to do the opposite? I am reminded of the eloquent remarks of United States Supreme Court Justice Brandes, who said that if we desire respect for the law, we must first make the law respectable. In my view, any constitutional settlement that restricts fundamental rights in the way that the Annan plan tried to restrict fundamental rights, and any plan which is predicated on segregation, apartheid, or any other such practices, would be disrespectful and it would be unjust. And on the uh, 50th anniversary of the granting of the Nobel Peace Prize to Dr. Martin Luther King, and on the 50th anniversary of the United States Civil Rights Act, I wish to draw your attention to the memorable words of Dr. Martin Luther King in his letter from Birmingham Jail of the 16th of April 1963. He attempted to address a question how does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? He replied, a just law is a man-made code that squares with a moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of Sir Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. By contrast, any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. And in that context, Martin Luther King referred to some legislation in the United States as falling within the definition of what he described as a segregation statute. And regrettably, the Annan plan, ill-fated though it is, was, in my view, a segregation statute. And Cyprus should not build its constitutional future on a segregation statute or a segregation constitution. Dr. Martin Luther King put his finger on it. All segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of security and the segregated a full sense of inferiority. Segregation ends up relegating persons to the status of things. Hence, segregation is not only politically, economically, and sociologically unsound, it is morally wrong, 
and sinful too. And I return to the point about rights. And I'm going to just read to you, I'm, I'm going to move slowly to the conclusions, but um, I'm going to read to you what Lord Sumption, uh, a British Supreme Court judge, said uh, a, a short while ago. Uh, rights are necessarily claims against the claimant's own community. He wasn't talking about Cyprus, of course. But he made a very important point. Rights are necessarily claims against the claimant's own community. And in a democracy, rights depend for their legitimacy on a measure of recognition by that community. What Lord Sumption teaches us with those remarks is that rights in favour of citizens act as constraints upon the state and in a true democracy recognition of rights by everybody including those in power conveys legitimacy upon those rights. We have a clash of values in Nicosia. Regrettably the spirit and the philosophy and the ideology from Turkey is not predicated on the empowerment of the citizen and the constraining of the state but it's the other way around. It's about the empowerment of the state and the disempowerment of the citizen. And you end up having a discussion, a constitutional quagmire in Nicosia, which is predicated on how to put together a segregation statute, an unjust law, a law which would degrade the human personality in the interests of a perceived political outcome. All of this is, if I can just put this to you, uh, contrary to the fundamental principles and values and ethics of open liberal democracies as reflected in the preamble and opening articles of the Treaty on European Union which the Republic of Cyprus is uh, 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 part of. And I just uh, put on this slide, I'm only going to show you a handful of slides today. Uh, there's a recognition that many of these fundamental principles of open liberal democracies owe, owe their origins to ancient Athens and they're reflected in the symbols of the West. The, the Greek letter Omega which is the symbol of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom and in the architectural design of the, of the White House. These are the principles, the rule of law, ethics, justice, equity, fairness, dignity, equality, human rights and responsibilities, fundamental rights, liberty under the law, democracy, competition, the free market, social justice, consultation, transparency, accountability, separation of powers, checks and balances, and so on. These are the principles that any settlement, I would hope, is to be built upon. Not the unjust legal premise that is an unjust segregation statute. And that takes me back to the judiciary. What then is to be the proper role of judges in a post-settlement Cyprus, it can only be as guardian of fundamental rights. And let me just make a very important supplementary point here. I'm not just talking about grand constitutional theory, I'm also talking about harsh commercial realities. The rule of law does not just exist for the refugee, doesn't just exist for the defendant who is in court proceedings, it, it exists for everybody, including business. Since 1974, Cyprus has developed itself as a commercial hub, as a shipping center, as a, uh, as a banking institution. It has a very important financial uh, role in, in the world. And fundamental rights exist as much for corporations and for other financial entities as for the private individual or for the refugee. And, and that point is recognized by, by the judiciary around the world. And indeed, just a few days ago, if I can just find the, the words, just a few days ago, uh, the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, uh, Lord Thomas, uh, made this very point on the 9th of July. I think, he's addressing judges here, I think we sometimes do not make it sufficiently clear that through developing the law and vindicating rights, 
whether they are private or public. Our judicial system provides the sure framework through which our society, its commerce, its industry can flourish, our freedoms can be protected, and the rule of law can be upheld. So an additional fundamental role of judges in protecting fundamental rights is to ensure that business can conduct its affairs. It's to ensure that contracts can be enforced. It's to ensure that a potential foreign investor who wants to come and spend money in Cyprus or, or buy into a particular industry or to support a particular enterprise has confidence that they will be entitled to broadly the same rights as they will have in England, in Scotland, in Germany, in France, in Spain, in Portugal, in Slovakia, in Slovenia, in Lithuania and elsewhere in the European Union. It's a very important point and it's something that the judges in England uh, keep on telling us that they are not just there to support the small man, although that is a crucial role that they perform, they are also there to support big business and in the event of a dispute to ensure that the rule of law and the principles of justice are applied fairly and properly without fear or favour. So that brings me now to my conclusions and I'm not going to read out to you what I've done in the third part of this talk but uh, I'll, I'll just summarise it. Um, there needs to be a proper consultation exercise in Cyprus so that the population of this island and everybody who has a stake in its future can, and including the judiciary, can contribute to it. In my paper, which I haven't uh, yet published, but which will emerge from this, this talk, I've jotted down about 40 or so questions which, will f which, w which should form part of any consultation exercise relating to the constitutional and justice-related questions that emerge from this talk. And I would submit that um, a consultation exercise is not just important, it's not just important for the purposes of uh, uh, going through the motions of giving the citizens a role in the decision-making process. Consultation is also important to help the decision-makers the people engaged in the negotiations to come up with better decisions that they would otherwise come up with, to fine-tune some of their ideas and to give legitimacy, most importantly, to give legitimacy uh, to the process. Now of these 40 questions, I'm only going to, let me just give you six as a sample. The most important question at the heart of any consultation exercise should go to the very essence of the Cyprus question. What is the objective? What should be the objective of the negotiations? Should it be to have a bi-zonal, bi-communal federation consisting of two politically equal communities? In so far as I'm aware, that question has not ever been put to consultation. It was the subject of, of the referendum in 2004, but it hasn't been put to a referendum. A second fundamental initial question that should be uh, addressed is Bearing in mind the checkered history of federations around the world, and bearing in mind the dis disintegration of so many federations, is it really wise for the Republic of Cyprus to reconstitute itself as a federation? Now, bear in mind there will be three judiciaries in a post-settlement Cyprus, three executive branches of government, three uh, legislatures. There will be presumably three ombudsmen, There'll be three chiefs of police. There might be three chiefs of uh, the Inland Revenue or whatever the, uh, the tax raising authority is here. How many layers of bureaucracy are there going to be? How many instruments of bureaucracy are, are there going to be? And is it really sensible, bearing in mind the, the financial crash that they had here last year, is it really sensible to build the constitutional future of Cyprus upon a bloated public sector? A third question, which goes to the very essence of any, uh, any constitution that is established, uh, what is to be the primary purpose of the legal and constitutional texts? What's to be the starting point? Is the starting point to be, as in the United States Constitution, to empower the people <coughs> and to empower the individual citizen? Or is the primary purpose and starting point to be the empowerment of the state? And if it's to be the empowerment of the state, 
what do we mean by the state? Do we mean the federal government? Should that be the primary objective of empowerment? Or should it be the two constituent state governments? These questions are too fundamental, I would submit, to be decided upon behind closed doors in strict secrecy by politicians with their diplomatic and, and, and other advisors. Now, I won't, won't go through the other 37 or so questions I've posed, but let me just throw out three which I think are particularly important to the judiciary. Uh, what is to be the relationship between the various courts within a post-settlement Cyprus? What is to be their relationship uh, between one another? Is the Republic of Cyprus or a post-settlement Cyprus going to retain the common law and the principles of equity? Uh, what is going to happen to the case law of the Supreme Court of the Republic of Cyprus before a settlement? Is that case law going to be binding upon the courts of a post-settlement Cyprus? What about the case law, in inverted commas, of the courts, in inverted commas, of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, in inverted commas? Is that case law going to have any weight in a post-settlement Cyprus? If so, what will happen if the Supreme Court of the Republic of Cyprus before the settlement says A, and the case law, in inverted commas, of the TRNC says something different, which will prevail? Uh, these are rather technical questions, but they ought to be the subject of a proper and transparent consultation exercise. They should be discussed, and the public should be aware, these are the questions that should be discussed now, before a settlement, not after a settlement. Because if you start having these discussions after a settlement, you're into the realms of deadlock, or potential deadlock, and crisis. So that's just a flavour of some of the questions that, uh, that need to be put uh, to a consultation exercise. Um, and I'll just, I'll just ask one more, actually. There's one more that caught my eye. Um, should Cyprus be subject to a system, or post-settlement Cyprus, retain what I understand they currently now have in Nicosia, which are the twin principles of constitutional review and judicial review? If so, how is constitutional review going to arise? How is judicial review going to arise? Is there going to be a system of legal aid? Who is going to administer the legal aid system? Who is going to pay for the legal aid system? Who is going to be entitled to legal aid? These questions which lawyers um, deal with on a day-to-day -day basis have to be addressed as part of a consultation exercise. So I conclude, I conclude. I've tried to make uh, three fundamental points in this talk. The first is that there must be a proper and transparent consultation exercise involving the judiciary. The second point I've tried to make is that the judiciary should play a central role in a post-settlement Cyprus, but as part of a proper separation of powers and as part of a constitutional architecture which protects the existing fundamental rights of Cypriots and all other lawful residents here in Cyprus, and indeed of anybody else who has a who has any involvement in Cyprus. But thirdly, the law is one thing, ethics and justice and values are another thing, but in the context of Cyprus they go hand in hand. The law, I would suggest, must be just, must be seen to be just, and it must be seen to be legitimate. And the only way you can do that is if you have a proper consultation exercise and have the population properly and adequately involved in the decision-making process. Otherwise, you will end up with a top-down uh, settlement and you will end up with a set of constitutional texts which, even if implemented and approved in a double referendum, will lack the legitimacy that is necessary to ensure the viability of a sovereign state, which is, I would hope, a member of the liberal democratic world. And on that note, I will draw this talk uh, to a close. Thank you.